Hey, what is up, mortals? It is Ellen here with a new video for you. Welcome to the seventh part of What If Deku Had the Rinnegan and the final part of Season 1. I just wanted to greet you guys by saying sit back and relax. You're in for a treat. So, we begin. Despite that day, their life moved on. Even after the strange break-in, Yue resumed its activities with a sort of confident carelessness that both comforted Izuku and put him at edge. Memories of the disintegrated gateway clung to his mind, flashing in his memories and seeping into his doodles time and time again as he went over that day with his mind's eye, confident that there was something he'd missed. And yet, it also proved to be something of a blessing in disguise, strange as it might sound. Because, after that day, Izuku found that the trio of himself, Uraraka, and Ida grew closer and closer still, sharing questions and curiosities about their strange discovery. Now, when they sat together, he didn't feel as awkward. For once, he'd met people with whom he could just… be with. People he could actually speak his mind to, who wanted to listen to him. Each time they joined him as he spoke of suspicions or curiosities related to the break-in, or even just general thoughts on something he enjoyed, he felt his chest grow warmer and his smile grow larger. Each time he thought, yeah, those were his friends. And that too was strange, but in the best way imaginable. On the next day, the boy with the concentrical eyes was seated in his usual spot, a filled notebook on his desk and sketching doodles on every page's corner as he watched the class with keen interest. Aizawa-sensei was standing in the forefront as usual, and the man's very presence commanded attention, if perhaps due to his ruthless stance towards wasted time. What he ended up saying, though, no one had expected. Today, we'll be doing a trial of rescue. The man's dry, murmured voice echoed cleanly throughout the room. It was decided that you'll be supervised by a team of three, Myself, All Might, and someone else. Aizawa-sensei carried himself with a sleepy sort of confidence, a cadence that helped him feel imposing even when he looked like he needed sleep, coffee, and therapy all at once. But though Aizawa looked as if he was as relaxed as he possibly could be, Izuku's mind immediately drifted towards the memory of the disintegrated gateway from before. All around him, the class exploded into chatter. They were excited, animatedly discussing the events yet to come, but Izuku could not help but feel a drop of dread mixed in with the excitement in his heart as he turned his head towards his friends, and all three of their gazes met. Bright caramel met dark gray met concentrical purple, and an understanding was shared between them. Finally, he let out a breath. He was being paranoid. It was good to keep his guard up, of course, but at the end of the day, this was still UA. The break-in, whatever that had been, had almost certainly been a fluke. Aizawa scoffed. Don't get ahead of yourselves, Aizawa warned, clearly irritated by their ceaseless chattering. At once, they shut up. Like I was saying, you all get to choose whether you wear your hero costume or just your PE uniforms. The training area is pretty far away, so we'll get there by bus. A pause. They all waited for his following words with bated breath. That's all, he concluded, a bit awkwardly. Go get prepared. And everyone collectively sweat-dropped. So much built-up expectation popped like that. But Izuku wasn't thinking about that. An external training area, huh? The boy mumbled softly to himself, his eyebrows furrowing softly. He had a bad, bad feeling about this. The bus trip ended up being pretty uneventful. While some of his classmates decided to poke fun at Bakugo's explosive temper, Izuku sat with Ida and Uvaraka and kept to himself and his group, smiling brightly each time the bubbly girl he'd befriended jumped up to laugh at his childhood bully. If either of them noticed how tense he'd grown when Bakugo jumped up to scream at them all in rage, no one mentioned it. But Ida had put a hand on his shoulder when he'd noticed him flinch, and Uraraka had flashed him a comforting smile, and Izuku had immediately felt his nerves lessen. He was powerful now. He could take down Bakugo in an instant. But more than that, he wasn't alone anymore. That was all he needed. Getting off the bus, though, was an entirely new experience. Wow! Uraraka exclaimed, eyes wide and mouth gaping. This place is huge! And she was definitely right. The entirety of Class 1A stood in front of a huge, huge metal dome, watching in awe as the space hero 13, who happened to be Uraraka's idol, explained the place's many functions. Seeing such a cool hero, 
Even as the pro-hero mumbled something to Aizawa, conspicuously lifting up three fingers, Izuku could not help but awe at the fact that this was his life now. Finally, the class walked in. The place was even larger from inside than it had seemed from outside. The USJ facility stretched as far as the eye could see, seemingly divided into zones. As they all followed Aizawa-sensei from behind, Izuku took a few moments to marvel at the sheer scientific genius that it has unquestionably taken to design such an amazingly intricate training grounds for them. A true rescue hero experience was right in front of them, yet another step into his ideal. And then Aizawa stopped, and Izuku's eyes caught onto something. A wisp of black smoke erupting into a spiral a few feet away from them all. It was like it came out of nowhere, like it simply materialized. And even as it did, it was twisting into itself. His eyes caught every detail, every twist, and every turn. He saw it expand just a bit, second by second. Saw a face peek at them from behind. And, just as Aizawa turned to scream at them all to hide, he knew. You all! Eraserhead's bellow came with unquestionable authority. Huddle together and don't move. Everyone! Izuku shouted just a bit later, swallowing his nerves. Do what Sensei says! Those are... More shapes crawled out of the shadowy gate, twisting silhouettes both humanoid and not. On each of their faces, a sneer blossomed like a bloody rose, vitriol dripping from their gazes. It was surreal. To say it out loud, he meant. And yet again, the scene from the gateway flashed into his mind, a benefit of his eidetic memory. A scene from a horror movie. Those are real villains! The mist-like man, unquestionably the one responsible for their apparent teleportation, stepped forward with a sort of composite confidence that reminded Izuku of a butler somehow. Strange, he spoke, his voice a deep baritone. According to the teacher's curriculum we procured yesterday, All Might was supposed to be here, and yet I can only see Eraserhead in thirteen. At once, Izuku, Ida, and Uraraka all flinched. Sometimes Izuku hated being right, but despite what one may assume, it became clear to his eyes that the Mist Man was not their leader. He could see it, the way their posture deferred to someone, the person their gazes all traveled to. And it was... I knew it, Eraserhead replied. So yesterday was your doing. The pale, sickly-looking man with locks of white hair and with a face and body covered by what looked like human hands. The man who stepped forward and, in a raspy voice, announced, Where is he? We went through the trouble to come here, and got so many people to come with us, too. You can't tell me the symbol of peace isn't here. In silence, a bead of sweat slid down Izuku's face, traveling the length of his cheekbone. His eyes were frozen, taking in every last detail about the man, the villain, as he spoke with a voice that sounded raspy and threatening at once. And what he spoke chilled him to the bone. I wonder if he'll show up if we kill the kids. This was not the sort of malice they could easily get away from. A pandemonium now grew amidst the students, between relentless questioning about the censors put in USJ, claims of the enemy's possession of a jamming quirk, and outright disbelief from what were unquestionably teenagers in shock. Midoriya stared at the horde of new enemies and felt fear and a deep, cold calm both fight for his mind. It sounds outrageous, someone muttered, but this isn't a random ambush. They're after something. That's, Uraraka-san murmured. Deku, Ida, we have to go! At that, his hands tightened into fists with enough force that his fingernails dug into the fabric of his skin and drew blood from it, the Rinnegan in his eyes thrumming with flowing chakra as he took on the sight of a horde of energy, feeling every last bit of his body, memorizing every last detail. And, as he thought that, a treacherous thought surged forward. He could beat them. Izuku knew that as firmly as he knew his own name. Even as he formed the words in silence to himself, his eyes responded with another pulse of power and chakra, the promise of yet more secrets to unravel laying just beyond his fingers. Even with only the diva path, Izuku could help. And yet... Thirteen, Aizawa announced, stepping forward as he pulled on his combat scarf, goggles over his eyes. They all stared at his back in incredulous shock. Follow evacuation procedures and try to contact the school. You too, Kaminari. There's a chance we're being jammed. Sensei! 
he cut in, desperation in his voice. Are you fighting them alone? Even if you suppress all of their quirks, your battle style... But he, too, was interrupted. Aizawa-sensei looked over his shoulder, the very image of calm confidence. No, his mind supplied. This wasn't Aizawa-sensei. This was the pro-hero, Eraserhead. A hero always has more than one trick up his sleeve. Within a second, he jumped into combat. Within a second, he'd landed in front of the hordes of villains, each deadly in their own right, and before they could even process what had happened, Eraserhead had moved in to completely dismantle them. He ducked under blows and responded quickly, weaving his scarf around like whip and capture net at once. He jumped over enemies and smashed both elbows and feet into them, a whirlwind of controlled violence. For but a moment, Izuku dared to feel hope. Later, he'd wonder if that's what doomed them all. No time to watch! We must move! Ida called him with an edge of desperation to his voice, and Izuku got ready to do as he said, eager to follow them out and contact the school. And yet, before it even happened, he knew. I'm afraid I can't allow that, came the mist man's voice. Damn it, he murmured. The teleporter! He was right to curse, of course. As long as an enemy such as this man was around, their chances of escape were null and void. Even now, his oppressive darkness encroached upon them, his burning yellow eyes staring deep into their own. My greetings, said the man. We are the League of Villains. We do apologize for the inconvenience, but we have taken it upon ourselves to invade you, A, the Academy of Heroes, with a simple task. We would like to slay the symbol of peace, All Might, if that is all right. He spoke of it with the same composed calm one may hear from a man speaking about the weather. No hesitation could be found, not a hint of anything but utter calm, a confidence in his ability, a knowledge of his purpose. Like he was stating that the sun was bright and not promising the murder of a beloved hero. We were under the impression that he would be here. Has that changed? Well, either way, this is my role. And his mist began to spread, until Izuku threw a hand towards him and bellowed something of his own. Diva Bath! The very air around them distorted. Mist was pulled and pushed at once as the strange man's eyes widened, and, with a sound like the crack of thunder in a stormy sky, he was pushed back a dozen feet with violent force from the sheer repelling force put upon him at that moment. The very ground beneath him shattered. And, as a dozen surprised eyes met him, the green-haired boy with the eyes of legend spoke clearly. Count the seconds. Five. He can teleport! If that mist gets you, he'll drag you away! Or worse! Sensei, please, get them out and then come back! I can ward him off! Four. I cannot leave you here! Thirteen responded immediately, though they were already funneling students towards the exit. There is a time to play hero, Majoria-san. Now come! Three. Like I said, uttered the encroaching darkness, and this time he came from all sides. I cannot allow that. Two. They all looked around in a panic, and Izuku stepped back. He saw Bakugo and Kirishima try to attack the misty substance, booming explosions coming from Katsuki's hand. He saw Uraraka and Ida step back as the shadows curled into them. Saw Thirteen try to find a way out. One. Everyone run! The hero announced. Just run! There is no use, responded the darkness, shadow incarnate. You will be taken. Already it was hard to see. He tried to push, tried to call forth the diva path, but his time limit had only just returned to him, and in this darkness he couldn't see the villain's body. And tortured. You bastard! Bakugo, trying desperately to attack the ink-like black abyss, cried out with such an unfathomable rage to his tone that even hearing it made Izuku flinch. Faced with the darkness, however, an ant's rage means nothing. And slain, Kurogiri finished grimly. And Izuku threw forward a hand yet again, his palm facing outwards, his eyes burning with power. And, just as the shadows moved in to consume him, called out, Diva Path! Itakun, run! If it had worked, he'd never know. Because, right then, the darkness swallowed him whole. Before we get back to the video, I'd like to talk about our new channel, Celestia, our channel dedicated to all things Dungeons & Dragons. Currently, we have a series breaking down the different spells in D&D, and soon, we'll be starting some new series as well. So if you're a fan of D&D, or have an interest in learning about it, check it out! 
Additionally, if there's something you've always wanted to see get made into a video, head over there and leave a comment mentioning it. And then he was falling, plummeting through the air at record speeds, his eyes still catching the wisps of darkness that had brought him there, curling in around themselves. Not just teleporting, he knew immediately, but the creation of portals between two places. But right then and there, Izuku had more things to worry about. Beneath him was what he recognized instantly as the Flood Zone, an area purposely flooded by the teachers to give them experience in dealing with floods and perhaps even drowning. There was a boat a bit off to the side and a good distance between it and the edge of the water itself, which just happened to be filled to the brim with villains. Though their silhouettes were hazy and hard to see, his Renegon could indeed see them clearly. In the water, he'd have the clear disadvantage and his diva path was still on recharge. Only a few seconds left now. He'd never tried to see what happened if he used the Asura path, which seemed very mechanical, inside the water. Hell, he tried to keep that particular side of his abilities a secret, knowing it looked particularly horrifying. But he had no choice. Just as he fell into the water with a crashing splash, he pulled on the energy that coursed through his veins, bright and constant, and watched as his arm unraveled into a familiar cannon as blue light built up from within. With water flowing into his nose and eyes and a clear sight of two villains encroaching upon him, he did what he had to do pointed forward, built up energy, and fired. Wisps of blue light that had no warmth yet burned as bright as plasma curled into themselves and erupted into a fiery explosion that consumed his sight. Within an instant, and in a crashing roar, the water that had surrounded him was both pushed back with intense violence and vaporized by the energy alone, mixing together in a deafening explosion that would have blinded lesser eyes. The two villains who were attacking him, who had been far too close to dodge, were similarly pushed back with explosive force. And with his eyes, he caught it. The sight of skin being burnt by the chakra expelled, their smug faces twisting and screaming in desperation. Izuku saw it all. He'd never really forget. Water soon came crashing back down upon him, and he resigned himself to using the diva path yet again to get himself to safety, only to find himself grabbed from behind and pulled away from the zone by a lean figure with a long tongue. Asui had grabbed him by the torso with her tongue and leapt away with such an impressive showing of strength and dexterity that, were his mind not consumed by the sight he'd just seen, the green-haired boy would have definitely geeked over. In a single movement, Tsuyu had chucked him over the rails and into the boat, letting him crash into the steel floor in something of a disgraceful heap. A second later, the short form of Mineta Minoru had similarly flung into the ship like a projectile, much to the smaller boy's despair. Only after did Tsuyu jump in herself, her movements graceful and her eyes both wide. She'd saved them both, he mused, before ever getting to save herself. At that moment, Izuku made a point of getting to know Asui-san better. Slowly, he pushed himself to his feet. Thank you, Asui-san, he began, only to be immediately cut off. Call me Suyu, she cut in, and I think we can leave the pleasantries for later. We're in quite the pickle. And maybe his brain short-circuited there because he didn't even call Itakun and Uraraka-san by their first names. Even in his panic, he couldn't help but gape at her for a few seconds before blinking and centering himself. His eyes narrowed. As Mineta rose to his feet himself, Izuku looked over the ship's rails and caught sight of the gathering villains below. Already, he could hear the short boy panic over their situations, and rightfully so. Stranded on a sinking ship, surrounded on all sides by murderers and worse, any man would have feared this, let alone young teenagers like them. B but there's no way they'd kill All Might, Mineta proclaimed in a daze. He'll just kick their asses! It's not like that'll stop them from hurting us, Asui-san reasoned, sounding unusually grim. They said they'd torture us to death after all. Yeah, any man would have been scared, but something in his head screamed at him that he wasn't any man. The Rinnegan seemed to burst as he looked at the villains who were swimming up to them from below, catching sight of their aquatic features. Sending Asui here had been a mistake. It was clear from that alone that they'd not researched the students themselves. But it wouldn't matter. No amount of research would have helped them anyway. Uh, Asui-san... No. Tsuyu-chan. The boy took in a deep breath, walking up to the railings and climbing on top of them. 
Absent-mindedly, he felt his cannon hand turn back into a normal one and heard Minetta gasp at the grisly sight behind him. He didn't care. He should care, but he didn't. I'm going to need you to jump as high as you can and take minetta -kun with you. Stay in the air for as long as possible. Can you do that? What are you going to do, Midoriya-kun? Midoriya Izuku looked down upon the shambling villains from above, confident in his knowledge that his eyes burned with a power none of them could fathom. Curly green locks danced softly with a passing breeze from all the disasters around them, and he pulled on the collar of his costume for a moment as if adjusting it. Solve the issue. In order to protect his friends. In order to accomplish his dream. In order to do anything at all. Midoriya Izuku had to stop holding back. He jumped. Behind him, he heard Mineta screaming as Asui grabbed onto him and jumped as high as she could manage and felt confident in knowing they'd be fine. As he plummeted into the water, he thrust both of his arms out and, just before his head was submersed, uttered two very simple words yet again. Shinra Tensei! After that, the water was no longer an issue. After all, it was no longer there. There are very few things scarier than seeing someone wield power beyond your own. At that moment, though, what each villain witnessed was a step beyond that. Each of those men and women had come to that place prepared to face down the next generation of heroes while their boss took care of the symbol of peace. The more realistic of them had likely resigned themselves to witnessing that man's amazing strength. Most of them had merely deluded themselves into thinking they were safe from him, putting their faiths into the plan they'd been hired to follow. What erupted from the flood zone was no Detroit smash, however. It was worse. For a single second, a flash of white consumed the waters, and then it was as if God himself had descended upon them. A sound so loud their eardrums could burst, an impact strong enough to shatter bones ten times over, a repulsive force of such explosive potential that the very ground beneath its center was shattered into fine dust and hundreds of gallons of water pushed violently towards both sides as gravity itself revolted against them. A dozen villains had been waiting in the water, thinking themselves the sharks about to smell fresh blood. But what is a shark to a god? Concrete was blown to bits in an instant, and water fell on them as if rain. The villains present soon found themselves occupied as their water-dwelling partners crashed into them violently. Silence soon filled the place, followed by the faint sound of approaching footsteps. In their shock, and after a few seconds, Shigaraki Tomura and Aizawa Shota turned to gaze at the flood zone at the very same time, and met eyes with a very angry Izuku Midoriya walking out of the cloud of smoke, strange purple eyes burning with energy. Asui Tsuyu and Mineta Minoru were behind him, looking just as gobsmacked as they all felt. The reason was obvious. Their teacher, Eraserhead, was a crumpled and bloody mess on the ground, his face barely recognizable. His nose had been shattered, his head smashed into the floor by sheer strength, and his face was caked in blood that was surely his own. And above him was the man covered in hands. At once, Izuku saw it, in the eyes of the villain's leader. Disgust, elation, rage, sorrow, desperation, euphoria. All of those conflicting emotions crossed the man's eyes in an instant, and as they did, the pale figure stepped back in shock and rage. Jeter, he rasped roughly, his voice as dry as the rest of him. Jeter, they're using cheats! The damn kids are using goddamn cheats! But his demeanor flipped immediately, like the pressing of a button, and his chapped lips curled into a blood-curdling smile. But that's all right. I've got my own. No, Moo. A heavy step was heard. Izuku couldn't tell from where. Chains of plans. Forget Eraserhead. Kill the green one first. Something broke. Something else exploded into movement. Where? But it didn't matter, because the abomination of a thousand souls was upon him in an instant, and then he could think no further, for a fist crashed into his stomach like a cannonball, and all he felt was pain. Izuku crashed into the wall with enough force to shatter his ribs, which it most definitely had. With a breathless gasp, he spit out globs of blood and likely a tooth or two, feeling searing hot pain consuming his consciousness and crippling his thoughts. Only then did he collapse, falling down after the impact was done into a gasping mess, 
spitting out blood as he fell to his knees in a daze. That. He'd seen it. The creature. He'd seen it come, but he couldn't even try to respond to it. The strong taste of copper filled his mouth as the beak-faced monstrosity stepped towards him yet again, its rock-like teeth bared and its exposed brain dripping. From behind this cursed behemoth, the villain grinned at him. What do you think, Hiraling? His raspy voice announced, glee now evident in it. Isn't my Nomu cool? He was made to kill All Might, you know. He's max level. Izuku ignored him. More blood dripped from his lips. It hurt to breathe. It hurt to think. With his ribs obviously shattered, there was no way he could get up. Even more importantly, he was undoubtedly bleeding internally. Even with... Despite his eyes, he'd... Izuku looked up at the creature, the Nomu. A being made to kill All Might. But that couldn't be true. All Might was a hero. All Might was his hero. All Might couldn't die. The thing walked up to him, grabbing his face with a hand bigger than it. The force alone felt like it would crush him. In a single moment, the Nomu lifted him up and mercilessly slammed him back into the ground. The ground gave in first, and Izuku knew pain. The Rinnegan's perfect sight blurred. Pain. It hurt too much to think. Too much to move. Even as he felt like he would cry, the superior enemy lifted him up and slammed his head into the ground again, parting his skin and bathing his scalp in searing agony and crimson blood. Uselessly, he gripped the thing's head. With his other hand, he called on the Asura path, forming a weapon yet again. His flesh shifted and swirled around the command. More pain filled his mind. It fired into the creature immediately and did nothing at all. It bore through the blow with but a whimper. If this kept up, Izuku would die. Despite his power, he would die. Even though he'd made friends and seen his hero was finally on the bright way to his dream, he would undoubtedly die. He had to get out. He had to get out. He had to... He had to kill it. His hands burned with chakra yet again. Uselessly, uselessly, he grabbed at the Nomu's head with all his strength, his fingers scratching at a skin they could not pierce, feeling himself being raised for one last blow. Nails drew just a little bit of blood from the thing. The other hand, the one that had finally transformed into a weapon, now burned brightly and vividly with more chakra, ready to fire a single devastating blow. Yet, he knew it wouldn't be enough. But that was okay. Because, for a moment, they met eyes, and Izuku saw nothing. Good. That way, he'd not feel bad about this. Izuku focused. Already his consciousness was thinning, waning, giving in to the pain. But he held on. Focus. He had to focus. He had to focus! His instincts would guide him. His eyes burned for this. The Nomu froze completely and Izuku's hands burned with bright blue chakra, but not as brightly as his eyes burned in an ominous violet light. The other hand, the one that was now a cannon-like structure, found its way into the thing's beak. Focus! He screamed to himself internally, delving deeper, forcing his way through. Suddenly, he had it. Ah, there it was. It was with a vicious grin on his lips that Izuku would pass out because he would only do so after ripping the thing's soul out of its body and blowing its head off in one blow. For a third time, the world was consumed by brilliant light and unyielding force under the Rinnegan's power alone. And that was, in and of itself, a victory. Thank you all for sticking around, and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave, we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day.